Okay. I turned my mic on. Okay. Uh, now let's get started for real. Um, okay. So first, are there any questions on the homework? Um, on the battle royale, as they call it? Um, any issues arising from that solution, simulation, estimation? So we're good. Either we're good or we haven't started. One of those two. I'm guessing. Okay, well, let me know. So I think there's um, there's like one thing I want to talk about with regards to the simulation, which can be which can be a little tricky. Okay, so basically once you um, you know what are you, what are you going to get out of the model? You're going to get uh, I mean, depending on what your model is, you probably get something like um, X, which is external innovation. Okay, probably get something like a tau, which is creative destruction. Okay, you have an entry rate. Okay, and in general, tau is going to be e plus x. Okay, tau is a total coming from entry and incumbents. All right. Now these are all going to go into your simulation. Okay, and the way the way I recommend doing a cutting quartum style simulation is, you know, like you basically section off. Let me draw this first, and then we can. So you you section off your. Uh, products and a, you know, a discrete number of products. Okay. Basically, you know, like one, one to P two, three and so on. Okay. Um, and for each of those, you know, you track a firm index. Okay. You can start it out because remember, so like, let's say you have a distribution over the number of products that a firm has, mu n, which we derived basically, you can get that. Uh, and let's say you have some distribution, like a CDF here, over the relative productivity of each of those or quality of each of those products, you can get that too, okay? But but getting the joint distribution of this and other firm characteristics is is more difficult, okay? That has no real analytic form as, as far as I know. Um, maybe. Um, actually, now that I think about it, it's not clearly impossible. But even then, no, nah, it's probably impossible. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's tough. So I think you got to simulate. So what you do is, you know, you, you have P products, a discrete number that you simulate, okay, and you keep track of the firm that owns each of them. And so, so like, it might be that, you know, F3 equals F5, right? It might be that the same firm owns product three and product five, okay? So you just, but you just keep track of that index as an integer, okay? And then these various events, like creative destruction and new innovation and entry, cause things to happen, okay? So um, basically, uh, I mean, re really, the, the the underlying events are X and E. Tau is just an aggregate. So so uh, for X, right? So let's say for X, um, with with some probability, okay. Let me get this right. So so when you when when firms do external innovation, it lands on a random product, and there's a unit mass of firms. And so each product is going to get hit by external innovation at some flow rate X or actually, you know, Delta X. So each of these products is going to get hit at some rate with a Delta X. And so in sense, in essence, a fraction Delta X are going to get hit with external innovation. Okay. And all you have to do is when, if, you know, if product three 
let's say product three gets hit by an external innovation shock. Okay. Um, what you do is you say, okay, well now I'm going to give that to another firm. It's going to be another firm that did that. Okay. And you know, like F7, whatever. And so, so how do you decide which firm that is? Well, firms that have more products are going to do more external innovation. So the probability should be proportional to the number of products that they have. So you just choose a random product, not a random firm, but a random product. You say, okay, well, the firm that's going to get that and that did that is F6. Okay. So you choose the product and then you say, okay, we're assigning F3. Now we're going to make that F6. Okay. So let's say that, you know, you know, let's say that before F3 was equal to F5 was equal to one and F6 was equal to two. Okay. Now we're going to move into, uh, um, F5 equals one and F3 equals F6. Equals two. Okay. Which is to say that, uh, N1 was used to be equal to two and N2 used to be equal to one. Now N1 equals one and N2 equals two. Right. Um, so that's how you can simulate it. And the good thing is that you don't have to keep track. It's not like some one, one sort of first approach you might take the simulation and say, okay, you have firm one and you keep a track of the vector of products that they have and you have firm two and so on. But these vectors are of different size. So you can't necessarily make a matrix out of it unless you cap it out at some maximum and bar or whatever. Right. And then you can make a matrix. But that's going to be like a huge sparse matrix, which is very inefficient. OK, so when you do it at the product line level like this and track the indices, you only have a, you just have one mate, one vector of length P. And that's it. And you can just simulate everything from there. When you have entrance, instead of assigning it to an existing product, you assign it to a new unused firm index. That's a new entrant. At the end, you can just add it all up and find what's, what's N1, what's N2, and so on. OK. Um, and then you can do the same thing for quality. Quality is even easier. It just increments and decrements uh, based on growth and, and innovation. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, that's how it works. That's going to induce this correlation. Uh, so the data we have is at the firm level, right? So you're going to simulate at the product line level. Then you're going to like basically here, and then you're going to aggregate to the firm level. Okay and you're going to get some outcome, which is like how many, so you, you get, you, so here you get how many products the firm has, and then you can aggregate that up to um, how many, how, what's their sales, what's their total revenue, what's their R&D spending, right? Um, so you need, you need to know that, you need to know, really, you need to know the, you know, you know, for firm one, what's their first products, productivity or quality, uh, firm one, what's their second products, in this case, there would only be two. Okay, so you need to keep track of the portfolio of products that they have, which you can back out ex post. Okay, um, yeah, and then you can you can calculate whatever you need to sales, revenue rather, uh, cost, profit, R and D spending, net profit, everything like that. You can growth rates once you simulate a panel. Okay, you can get all of that. All right, so you just have to. This memory structure though is is kind of the the most efficient way to do it. Okay. Um, yep. Um, and then I guess, yeah, I mean, it's tricky to set up the, the solution and everything too, but I think the simulation can be tricky as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, once you have this, once you have the solution, you got these equilibrium variables, then you can do the simulation in this way. Then you can generate your moments and, and you're going to be all set to do GMM. Okay. So that's the basic idea. Okay. So, um, all right, I guess, yeah, I mean, if you guys, if you guys have questions on the homework that come up, you know, let me know. So we're going to, we're going to be doing some kind of other stuff, like kind of text analysis stuff. But if you have questions on the homework, just, just drop, you know, send out a chat question or whatever and we can we can switch to that if you want okay or maybe at the end of class okay um all right so let's let's go ahead with uh 
we were doing, we started doing last time. Okay, so um, where are we at? Slides. Okay, so the, these are these were these text analysis methods. Will be multiple assignments. Um, we're kind of running out of time here. I mean, I'm thinking I should. I'll probably have like yeah. I mean, let's let's have a let's have an ML assignment um, because yeah, we don't really have a oh the econ one. Yeah, I did actually. There's a question. The one question is multiple assignments. We should probably have an ML assignment. Okay, we're gonna try and fit that in because we. We don't really have an exam, so let's just try and fit in one more assignment at the end, okay? Um, uh, econlib, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, let me make sure that I push that onto GitHub and then I'll send you a link, okay? So let me just open it up here and make sure that I updated it. Are you updated, econlib? Yeah, you're updated. Um, Okay. Um, yeah. We want to web scrape and do text analysis on government documents. Yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay. So, so for econ lib, let me push that to GitHub so you can get, so you guys can get that. All right. Uh, one second. I just want to do this now so I don't forget. Um, I just need to change this one thing and then we're all set. So this is going to be, let me give you a little overview while I do this. So I mean, this is basically a structure for pulling in uh, sort of relevant variables. So, so essentially the, the structure here though, is like you've got four classes of like stuff that's coming in. They're totally not related. Yes. To, you know what? That's fine. If, if it is related to your research, that's cool. If it's not, that's also cool. Uh, so, but so we got so for econlib the the basic structure is you got four types of variables, what I'm calling like alg params, algorithm params. That's like your delta t, your your you know step size, uh, not, not your steps, your time step, delta t, the number of grid points, stuff like that. Stuff stuff that's not really model, it's implementation on the algorithm side. Okay, um, being, okay, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so um, so that that's the algorithm param stuff, and then params parameters. Is the next one, which is actual parameters like lambda, cost parameters, elasticities, all that stuff. Okay, your equilibrium variables. That's stuff you're solving for endogenously. Okay, uh, and then policy, which is the stuff that's going to change. It's not. It's like changeable by whoever's setting policy, and it's going to affect equilibrium parameters. I mean, it's, they're kind of like parameters in a way, but I like to keep them separate. Okay, so um, there's that. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. So, so, so what it does is it, it allows you to store those all, okay? And um, it does it in an intelligent way, okay? There's this there's this uh, file format called Toml, T O M L. It stands for like Tom's own markup language. There's this guy Tom that did it. Uh, it's basically it's it's very intuitive, and you can just write all these these parameters, and you can put in comments. So you can have different parameter sets. It's like, oh, this one works well, or like this one works better and optimize that and stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's what we're doing. And that's, I think it's a good sort of starting point in that sense. Okay, so uh, one more thing. Okay, and then, so let me, I needed to just change some stuff here. So let me push that now and then and then we can Look at it, okay. Um, I guess we can look at it real quick uh, on GitHub once I push it, okay. So, um, all right, this is probably like not one hundred percent correct, but I'll, I'll fix it after class, okay. So, um, cool. All right. Okay, so we're, what I'm gonna do is uh, go to GitHub. Got some stuff here. Doing a little coronavirus stuff on the side. We can talk about that if you want. Um, 
first let's go to Gunlib. Just update it. Okay. So this is just this just defines um, like a model file. What I'm calling model.py. All right. So here. Um, okay. So you load in NumPy, pandas, whatever you need. Also Toml, and then uh, optimize those like fsolve and at fmin and friends. Okay. From scipy. Okay. Um, this stuff is just sort of loading Toml files in a in a more sane way. Okay. And then, so so now what it does is it's just to find a class, okay? Okay, so it defines a class that represents the model and you can instantiate it by giving it um, uh, algorithm params, parameters, policies, and, and equilibrium variables, okay? So these are gonna be like files, right? That say like lambda, the, the step size is equal to 0.1. Elasticity, cost elasticity of R and D is 0.5, like gamma, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so it's going to define those, and then what this does is when you give it to those, if if you actually give it something, a file, it'll just load those in and make those variables members of the class. Okay, so with Python, with a Python class, you say like class model. Okay, this defines how to like initialize it. It loads everything in, so you give it like a set of parameters, for instance. Okay, then. Um, what all this does is, is it's like it makes it so that you can, you know, make lambda just a, a variable in the class, so you can address it whenever you want. Okay, so you don't have to like carry it around and pass it to different functions. It's just there, and you can use it. Okay, and that has a, a thing, on on a, an empty function right now, but you would define this called eq func, which would take in, um, it would look at the equilibrium variables, it would calculate what's the you know. It, it calculates your your equilibrium variable, your system of equations. You know, so the labor market it'll it'll take in the wage and a bunch of other stuff and spit out how far off is the labor market clearing condition, uh, how far off is the FOC for optimal innovation, um, what's what is is the growth rate right given what we guessed and what comes out of innovation rates. All those equations you know, that the system of equations we got to at the end of uh, cutting quartum, there's like four or five of them depending on how you set it up. It'll take in, it'll look at the equilibrium variables and then calculate those differences. And then solve will just solve that overall. It'll find equilibrium variables that, you know, make that thing zero, that system of equations zeroed out. Okay, so um, this is just a, a really, you know, bare bones skeleton kind of thing. Um, but this will get you, the, this is the basic structure. Okay, and so then you'd have like a parameter file and you start with, and then you can. Find the equal variables and save those if you want, um, so that they can. That next time you load it up, it'll just already be solved. Okay, um, and then you can also do when you do estimation, you you're gonna also optimize in, in like in a similar way over variable over parameters to to maximize some likelihood or sorry, in this case GMM uh, quadratic form objective. So you you create like a GMM objective and then have a you know you know estimate function which would which would optimize that. Okay, but uh, yeah. So the good thing is that because of the class structure, your your variables are just you know, m is is like the model itself you take in, and you just do like m dot lambda, and that would be lambda when it, w that you load it in. Okay, so you don't have to carry it around and pass it as a parameter to all sorts of functions. It's just always there. Okay, that's the basic idea. Okay, and then you I usually like kind of run things out of a notebook so I can visualize easily. Okay, so that's um, I think it's a good starting point. Um, or at least you can kind of see stuff here. Maybe that's useful, especially kind of loading in parameter uh, sets from files is, is pretty useful. Okay. Um, if I think of anything else, I'll, I'll push another update that, that should be changed. Or that's like a useful sort of general construct. Okay. But I think this is a good start. Okay. Um, yeah. And then this is a, it's a public repository. If, uh, make sure it's public. Yeah, it's public. Uh, it's public, so you can just download it right off the bat. Okay, uh, or get you can get clone it, or you can download it. Like I said, I suggest using Git to to get it. Um, so that way, if I update it, you can pull in the updates. Okay. Um, I guess you could fork it, but you should probably just copy it, and then uh, yeah, and you should yeah. I mean, if you haven't used Git, then you should learn how to use Git too. It's pretty useful, especially if you're coding stuff. Use Git. You don't want to lose your work, or if you do something that you turns out you went down like a 
blind alley of, you know, you, you implemented something that worked, but it turned out to be a bad idea. With Git, you can just roll it back, you know, a few hours and say, okay, well, let's start back from where we were when, when everything worked. Okay. Or if you get something where you do a whole estimation and you get a certain set of parameters, just commit it right then and there. And if it'll be totally reproducible, as long as you just check out that old, that old, uh, commit, um, and if you change stuff and break it in the future, you can always just go back. Okay, so it's good to have a reproducible workflow, and Git is kind of ideal for that. Okay, um, and it works in Windows, Linux, OS X, all that, right? So it's it's cross platform. Uh, it's decentralized. It's not tied to GitHub. You could do it without GitHub if you want, um, but GitHub's useful. So if you use GitLab, that's another option. So it's good. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so then, yeah, that's where I, that's where I'd start. Uh, now, anything else? Let's see. Uh, so we want we want a web scrape. Yeah, we could we could talk about web scraping. Um, what do you want a web scrape? I'm thinking. So here, you know, like stuff that people web scrape include, it's like you know, things. It's always ideal if you can just get the person or the agency to give you the data, because then there's a little less government documents general business papers stuff like that um if, if you can get them to give it to you that's always good but sometimes they don't like to do that locations of facility oh you want to do that yeah okay um yeah so sometimes it's like you know you do like a, a foia request uh can you uh, i got a question another question here can you recommend an example something like a paper or application file that's similar to the homework problem i don't know how to get started what type of simulation estimation works um you know, the problem is that like there are not many simple uh, most papers that do this stuff are like crazy complex and they give you the code and it's like a huge nightmare basically um, but I can you know you know the, the the so the look at the neoclassical growth code that I have the for solving that's a good structure okay uh incorporate that with like the econ lib structure okay i think that's a that's a good way to start it's get the neoclassical growth stuff working maybe even like estimate that in some sense okay but um with 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 aggregate moments okay like a calibration sort of thing um but but here's the basic workflow quan econ yeah, QuantiCon's good. I haven't looked at that that much, but I, yeah, I've heard good things. And when I have looked at it, I've been I've been impressed. Um, and they have a, a full Python suite there. Uh, they can get a little crazy with the object-oriented programming, which is I'm not always a fan of, but but I think they're generally pretty good. Um, so, the, but the basic workflow is, you know, in terms of like if you're doing something like EconLib, it's like you've got your algorithm parameters, you've got your parameters, okay. With those, you can define a system of equations that map from the very the equilibrium variables into into the equation values. You want to solve that system of equations, okay? How do you solve that? Let's go back here. Uh, you can use this, this SciPy optimize has has uh, optimization functions. So you, once you have that, um, let me check out this. QuantiCon business. Uh, so yeah, they have different advanced, I guess, advanced quantitative programming. The web version. Okay, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff here. So I don't know how, wait, do they have a general? They're doing a lot of stuff, yeah, and that, that gets like, it gets pretty heavy, okay? So that, that might get more into to, to, to techniques for like, um, spectral methods and, and stuff like that but uh you know for for the basic stuff it's like you know you have that system of equations which is like e you can define eq func to, to give you that system of equations and then you run it through f solve you give the f solve this function and it'll it'll find the uh you give it an initial starting guess for the equal variables and it'll find how to set those equal to zero if it can and what that's going to return is a set of equal variables Right. And that's, that's your, that's your model solution. Now, once you do that, okay, then that's, that's like the inner layer. Okay. The outer layer is the estimation. The estimation you're optimizing over parameters now. So then with the estimation, 
you define some GMM objective function, a quadratic form that maps from the, the moment errors, the differences between your true moments and your simulated moments weighted by whatever weighting matrix you have. You define that estimation objective. And what that objective is gonna do is take in a set of parameters, go in and solve the whole model for that, okay? So to solve for that set of parameters to solve the equilibrium variables, simulate, do whatever it needs to, to generate uh, moments and spit out those moment value, the, the, the simulated moment values. Now the GMM objective is gonna take those simulated moment values, compare them to the data, run them through the quadratic form, return it. And you're gonna maximize that objective over parameters now. So you're gonna find the best fit parameters. Okay, so that's gonna be like an F min kind of thing. So you're not solving zeros in this per se, you're, you're, you're minimizing this quadratic form, which should get your simulated data close to your true data, okay? Then, yeah, once you do that, you get the parameters, that's it, right? Then you can say, look, here's here's the best fit, here are my standard errors, I calculate with, you know, you know take out Hayashi, program those up of those linear algebra equations, um, and then you're all set. So, uh, and then you can get your standard errors and you can even simulate more stuff if you want uh, at the optimum, investigate what's going on. Uh, you could do optimal policy. You don't have to for this, you could, um, stuff like that. So that's um, that's the basic workflow, okay? Oops, I don't have my, uh, cool. So, you, okay, cool. Yeah, sorry, the text, the chat was obscured for a second there. Okay, so um, yeah, the other thing I, well, this is out there, but like maybe, this is less well known, I think, for, for in Python land is you can, um, well, you can do linear algebra, right? So when you're calculating your standard errors, you can do, you can do linear algebra and there's like, I guess just use this console, you know, there's, there's, there's np.linalg, right? That has like invert, this is called in, this is the real thing. So it's like invert a matrix, just like in my lab. Okay, so you can do that. Uh, there's there's np dot dot okay dot product, and then matmul matrix multiply. So you got all this stuff. Okay, the other thing is like um, if you want to do like let's see, you create a, a matrix like this, and D is like that. Okay, so then A and B are, you know, it's a, a two by two matrix with ones and a vector with ones. You can do, so uh, so A is two by two and then uh, B is one by two. So then you should be able to do B times A and actually you can do this, okay? At is a matrix multiply operator. You don't have to use np.matmol. You can just do B at A that does B times A, okay? And then it's, it's one by two by two by two, so one by two times two by two, so it'll give you a one by two back, which it does, and it gives you the correct answer. And then like A, B should not, wait, so A, B shouldn't work, probably somehow it does, I don't know, it figures it out for you. You should try and do it the right way, but um, I guess it decided, wait, so it's, that's a two, two, two by one, two, yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe it just decided that it, it was going to switch things around. So, but you should really be doing something like that. Okay. So, um, you know, I think it, it, if it's a vector, I think it tries both ways and it sees, it sees what works. So be aware of the add operator, especially when you're calculating those, calculating those standard errors, you can pretty much write out whatever is in Hayashi if you use add in the right way and invert in the right way. And you don't have to do nested matmol, all that stuff. It'll, it'll figure it out. Okay. So be aware of that. Okay. Um, all right. So I think that's it. Well, that's all I have to say right now for the for the homework stuff. Okay. But uh, keep me posted how things are going. All right. Um, and uh, we can go from there. Now, let's jump over to text analysis. Okay. So oh yeah. So what do we want to what do we want to scrape? Um, so the stuff that I've seen scraped, I mean, if, if you can't get the government agency to give you the, the data, you know, sometimes you do these, people do these FOIA requests for stuff and like they could just give you a CSV or an Excel, but they give you, 
like 100 megabytes of PDFs and tell you to figure it out. That's never fun. But, you know, if you have a website, well, that's a good start and you can you can scrape that. OK, so it's like, you know, like uh, the SEC um, Edgar filings. OK, uh, the, fi- uh, the 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 financial like the public companies have to um, file various documents talking about what they're up to, their earnings and everything like that. I forget the number exactly what it is, but there's a number for it. Uh, you can get those. It's like sort of talking about what they're up to and you can analyze that in a textual sense. Um, uh, legislation that, that I think you can get in a more structured way, but, but you still need to parse a little bit. So, but, but, you know, usually the kind of stuff that you're doing is, uh, is, uh, scraping html right okay so that's there's a there's a library called beautiful soup um which is pretty good for that okay um and you can yeah i have a i have an example on my my data science tutorial that scrapes the you know the pittsburgh social seminar social science seminar website um this yeah so it scrapes that and like parses everything in a certain way okay um yeah uh so you know that's an example you've got this text data it's like basically i mean it's in a pretty good format right now uh but then you can get you know a a structured you know csv kind of thing data frame out of it okay um so maybe um we can go over that i mean we can go over a government website The the other thing that can be useful which is which is getting more a little bit more popular these days is is using the the Wayback Machine, um, which is like the you know, it's a history thing for the internet. So basically, uh, you um, it it has snapshots of uh, different of web pages at different times. Okay, so um, you can go to let's see, let's see, web that way way back way back machine. So like I I was you know I was using it the other day. Uh, that's not a thing. Let's do this web. So it's not happy. If you have a website, you want to see the history of it. It'll give you an internal server error for some reason. Okay, now it didn't. All right. So if you have a website that you want to get the history of, so like this, the website. Are you, you, am I am I doing this right? What just happened? Okay. Okay, you're seeing this, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you have a website, so this one was the uh, the data on um, uh, what's called non pharmaceutical interventions, uh, public interventions like lockdowns, restaurant closures, and all of that that have happened across the states. This has um, the current state of affairs for a bunch of states and uh, cities in those states. So, but it's pretty unstructured, you know. Um, it's not clear how to track this. You, so, so first, you can you can parse this, right? You can go in beautiful soup, okay, and uh, you like you can't see my right click apparently. So you can you can right click on stuff if you do it, inspect element in either Chrome or. Uh, uh, Firefox or whatever your uh, window uh, your browser is. Okay, now you can kind of see it. It's not super pretty, but you can get this thing here. And you can kind of see the HTML structure. So you're, but the, you can see like you know you're looking for like this big div here, and then there's going to be a bunch of like uh, item kind of looking things. Okay, and then you know each of those has all this information. Okay, so it's like Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, da, 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 you know, so on. Um, and so you, you can you can once you understand that structure of the website, then you can parse it pretty easily with with beautiful soup. Okay, um, and then so that'll get you, that'll get you a snapshot. That's pretty good, right? Um, and then the other thing you can do is if you want to get the history, right? So this is changing constantly, right? So we wanted to get the history. When did they actually implement these things, right? So this one, I guess it, it does say when they implemented it. Okay, so but it, maybe you want to get the history uh, for for in another setting you might want to get a history. And so for that, you can see here on the Wayback Machine, they started 
you know, taking snapshots of this page on the March 24th and, uh, which I guess is when it came up, when it started existing. And you can see they took up you know, like 10 snapshots, you know, between four and 10 snapshots every day up until today. Okay. So, um, yeah, so you can do that. You, and so you can look at the different snapshots and parse these. There's a, there's a way back machine API, which you can use to get a list of all of these and do that automatically. So you don't have to go through. Um, so if you like Wayback Machine API, okay, um, then there's a way of querying particular websites and it'll give you back a list, okay? Uh, and there's, yes, yeah, so I think you want to use a CDX server, um, which is documented here. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's kind of complicated, but you, you can get, you can do it in an automated way. You don't have to go through and manually do everything. Okay, so that's the basic idea there. Um, okay, so we can do that. Uh, I don't know. Let's 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 figure out what we want to, what our use case is going to be. Um, but you know, when we get there, then we'll decide. Okay. Uh, but first, let's let's do some text analysis. Okay. Now we did it. We did this. We we went through many of these slides um, already last time. Okay. So basically, you know, we were looking at uh, this vectorization approach, okay, where you ignore word order and you look at either incidences of words or incidences of of tokens, like one grams, one word phrases, two grams, two word phrases, three grams, three word phrases, and so on, okay? You can do pretty well with that, especially once you get up into to two or three grams, okay? Um, and then, uh, you know, you can, so you can do that on your own data. You can use the Google Ngram Viewer externally to, for some broad, notion of, of the frequency of words and phrases, okay? Um, and then you can do weighting techniques, okay, where you look at the document frequency, the fraction of documents that are that contain that word and and uh, upweight the more rare words and downweight the more common words, okay? Um, and then once you've got that, where you kind of normalize these vectors, L2 normalize the vectors such that they're sum of squares across all the words, zero and uh you can multiply then those two vectors together and and by by that virtue of them being l2 normalized and positive they're going to be that multiply the the product of them the vector product is going to give you some number between zero and one which represents their similarity and which takes on the value of zero when there's no word overlap and takes on the value of one when there's perfect word overlap in terms of frequencies okay so um and that's called the cosine similarity that gives you the the angle between them and that whatever vector space you're in. Okay. Uh, so that's useful. Okay. Um, something I've been thinking about is using sentiment analysis or phraseology, government docs to categorize policy objectives. How hard? Yeah. I mean, um, so, so sentiment analysis uh, is a thing. Um, so that's, that's that's so, the, so what we're doing here, for instance, is more getting at like the topic of discussion. Okay, I mean you you maybe get a little bit out of sentiment, but if you want to really do sentiment analysis, then you got to leverage um, some other sort of external, externally trained probably um, sources of information. Okay, so uh, there's there's stuff where they they train algorithms and so this this this, this requires us to we'll, we can address this later you know getting into the more advanced ml techniques but I mean, basically you um you just you can train an algorithm on like say yelp data you look at the review you have the score and so you can use that as a method of mapping between uh what people are saying and kind of how positive or negative they are on something okay um and then once you have that then you can extrapolate that to whatever domain you're looking at. Now, the problem is you, you want to extrapolate it to a domain that has nothing to do with restaurants. That might be difficult. It's like, you know, you would not say that, you know, oh, this policy doesn't taste very good, you know, because that's not a thing. Um, seems like a cool way to create economic data. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can, the the looking at, you mean using sentiment analysis on, uh, on government policy documents, basically. Um, yeah, so you can, I'm trying to think, you can, 
I mean, if you're looking at legislation, it's pretty. Oh, my example. So yeah. Uh, oh, with Yelp. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So a lot of people are using Yelp. They they're pretty good about releasing. They they've released this big data set um, uh, of of to the text of reviews and things like that. And the method, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it 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 can be useful. So you can use it on uh, tweets. You can use it on. I mean, it's hard to use on something like patents because it's like, what what is the sentiment? Are people really positive or negative in patents, or are they just sort of dry technical? Okay, so yeah, it, if you're in a setting where you're not you're outside of the dry technical realm, you can get sentiment, um, or you could do another feature of text that's not sentiment. That's I don't know, confidence, for instance, right? Um, you could try and um, <clears throat> look at uh, times when people are making predictions. Okay. Uh, and uh, look at the words that they're using and correlate, not correlate, but like with ML, correlate that with how positive or negative they are in terms of like, is GDP gonna go up or down? Okay, like let's say you're looking at forecasters and they have text associated with that. Um, then you could train an algorithm to, to see the level of confidence. You could even correlate it with the actual outcome and, and, and try and not just get confidence, but like how accurate they ended up being which might be correlated somehow with confidence. Um, and then you could use that in another setting uh, to, to understand pe people's level of confidence. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do. And it I mean, it, essentially it rely you need training data, right? You, you kind of always need training data um, and you need to be able to extrapolate from whatever domain you trained on to your new domain, okay? Now that can be difficult because, for the, you know, for the, the example of extrapolating from Yelp to, you know, let's say you're looking at Federal Reserve Blue Book, I think it's called Blue or Green, some kind of colored book. Um, uh, they talk about what's up, what's happening in the economy, what their kind of feeling is. Maybe you 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 want to extrapolate from Yelp to that. It's not clear that that's that's super possible. Um, one thing you can do is what's called fine tuning. Okay, so fine tuning can help with uh, the problem of extrapolation, okay? And with fine tuning, you, you essentially, you, you, you do most of the training on the biggest data set that you have, which might not be 100% applicable to your data set, but it'll understand things that are common to many, it, it'll at least, it'll get things that are common to many problems, and it'll get things that are sort of specific to that domain, like restaurant reviews. And then with fine tuning, you take that initially trained model and then you fine tune it on your own data, which doesn't need to be as big, okay? And that'll kind of fine tune the, the outer layers maybe, or maybe the inner layers. So some, some of the layers, it'll fine tune them uh, to, be, to be more applicable to your particular domain, okay? So for that, you do have to generate your own training data on your domain, um, and then you can then extrapolate into the rest of your domain, okay? And then there, the extrapolation issues can be partially alleviated. Um, so when they take surveys of experts, could you use those phrases and words as the training for policy for the policy? Yeah, I mean, like what uh, there's there's probably a better example than this, but I don't know if you've ever seen those. Um, well, they you know when they when they have the, uh, the 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 surveys of economists and they're like, do you agree with the statement? And they give it a score and they also say stuff. I think, but they don't say that much. But let's say that they said stuff more often. Then you could look at that and train it on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so that would be good. And that would also be good because it's, it's more or less within domain. You're, you're looking at economists, you're training on economists and you're extrapolating to like fed economists, basically, or fed people that work at the fed. Right. So, um, it's, it's sort of the, the extrapolation issues shouldn't be too bad. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, you can, you can use that. The other thing you could do is you do have a longer history of, of fed statements, um, and actions. Uh, so you could, uh, train that and then extrapolate it forward in time. So you're staying within domain, you're just you're just forecasting forward in time, okay? Um, and that gets to the inference forecasting issues, right? So they, you, you wanna be sure to avoid overfitting and all that so you can get a, a decent forecast, okay? Uh, but that, that would be a pretty cool exercise, I think. Uh, okay, so, so we can do that. We can you know, so, so getting back to the text similarity stuff. So we can we can look at the similarity between two documents. Okay, no problem. Um, I'll just I can just keep you know weaving back and forth. It's cool. Uh, so with the 
with the similarity stuff, you know, you can look at the similarity between two documents with the vector product. And then because, so the corpus, remember, is the set of all documents. And if each document is a vector, the corpus is a matrix. And if you multiply the corpus by itself, you get a matrix of similarities between all the documents, as long as you get the transpose right. Okay. Now, um, that's, that, I mean, that that's just, that's fast, first of all. I mean, it's faster. It, 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 you, you're not going to have to do a big loop or anything like that. And it's also useful because you can analyze it systematically and cluster things. Okay. So, um, all right. So this, this, I'm going to skip this. This is just the, you know, the how to add and multiply things, which we, which we know. Okay. Um, okay. Then you got the, you got the document clustering. Okay. We talked about that. We talked about k-means clustering uh, and all of the other clustering algorithms that are out there. Those are in sklearn. Okay. So we're going to go through this in, in detail. Uh, I mean, in code in a minute. So let's, let's just wait till we do that. ML stuff, you can go nuts, GPT-2, all that. We'll talk about that as well. Okay. Um, this is, this is Moby Dick. Uh, okay. So now, now we're going to go into, you know, uh, code. We're going to look at implementation details and everything like that. Okay. So in terms of tools, I mean, you, you can do it in R, I think. But you should probably use Python if, if you're if you're doing serious text analysis. Okay, um, there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff at every level. You know, you got NLTK, Natural Language Toolkit, which is sort of the more linguistic side of things. Parts of speech: is it a verb? Is it a noun? I don't know. Is it an adverb? Um, and and you can classify that stuff, and you can look at word co-occurrence and sentences and all of that, so you can really understand things at a, a linguistic level. Okay. Um, and then you got sklearn, which is kind of the data science ML-ish side of things. Okay. And there you can, that does your text factorization for you sparsely. Okay. So the one thing is that most, most documents do not contain most words, right? These vocabularies we're looking at here are going to be million or so, a million or so. And if you're doc, you know, if you have documents that are hundreds of words and you have thousands of documents, you have still probably only have like a million vocabulary words. Um, even if you have millions of documents, really. Um, and uh, so then each document contains a very small fraction of the set of possible words. Okay. And so if you thought about it, uh, the document is a vector, it's going to be a very sparse vector. And if you thought about the corpus as a matrix, it's still going to be a very sparse matrix. Okay, so for that reason, you have I mean, you basically have to store these vectors as sparse vectors. Okay, and the and the, just you know just to that's where are we at here. Let's go to the, the whiteboard. So if you want to if you want to just a quick aside on on sparsity here. Okay, so if you, if you want to uh, think about sparse matrices. Okay, so you know I mean you have a matrix. Okay. And uh, okay, we're gonna not go too crazy here. And I, for horizontal lines, I think we need to use the ruler here. So we got a matrix. I don't know why I'm going through and drawing this whole thing, but I've already started and I can't stop. So um, and let's say that you know, you know, you have let's put in numbers actually. One, two. This is like a word occurrence matrix. Okay, and I guess. Every row should have a word, so let's say that one, okay? And then everything else is assumed to be zeros, okay? So um, so basically what sparsity is going to do is instead of storing, you know, a large fraction of this as just zeros, which is kind of wasting space, it'll say, okay, well, at coordinates uh, zero, okay, so row zero, column number zero, one, two, three, we're zero indexing here, we have a two, okay? So that's basically a triplet of integers, okay? Um, uh, row one, column one, got a one, row two, column four, got another one, uh, row three, column zero, got a four, and then last one, row three, column three, we got a three. Okay, so now before this is a, what, this is a, a four by five, so it was like a 20, size 20 matrix. Okay, now here, I hope we, we hope we did better than 20. Uh, three times five, 15. We saved 25% of space. Now this is um, 
that's not great actually in terms of space savings but if you have millions and millions of entries then you start it's you start saving a lot more space this is basically linear this is like three times n and where n is the number of non-zero elements versus n squared so the bigger n gets the bigger the gap the savings are going to be right the savings are going to be on the order of of well 3n or, or basically n okay so as, as your matrix gets bigger uh your savings gets bigger too okay so that's the that's the utility of sparse matrices and there's everything in like the the basic linear algebra stuff is implemented sparsely so if you want to matrix multiply it doesn't like convert it to dense and then multiply it just multiplies with the indices themselves so you still you're, you're like hyper efficient okay um and that's 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 good if you're looking at these similarity stuff you multiply the matrices together you do it oops just in the uh sparse landscape okay so um and then the only other thing to worry about once you really start getting down into the weeds which hopefully you don't you could just exist at a higher level of abstraction but you know there is there are various ways to represent sparse matrices there's there's csr the coo honestly i don't remember what these stand for what but it, it's basically do you give it the coordinates do you give it like the index like how do you index them there's just a million different ways CSR and CO are two of the most common, but they're implemented in SciPy. Okay, so should you need to go down that road, you can, but usually it's better if you avoid going down that road. Okay, so um, that's sparse matrices. They're pretty cool, actually. They're very, they're very useful. Um, and, and you can usually do everything at the high level. Okay, if you, if you end up having to get down and like manipulate their data structures directly, give me a call and I'll, I'll set you straight. Okay, or I'll show you how to like do it in, in purely sparse mode okay does it matter if it's numeric or string not really um i i'm well kind of does i mean scipy only has numeric sparse matrices okay and they can be floating point in fact they might always be floating point i'm trying to remember i feel like i've had issues with that in the past um yeah, so in sci-fi, they have to be numeric, I believe. But you could, if you really wanted to do it, I don't know why you would, I, I can't think of a use case for having strings as the values here. But if you really wanted to, you could just create a lookup table. You could say, you know, the 0, 3 corresponds to string number 2, which is hello world. 1, 1 corresponds to string number 1, which is goodbye world. Two, four is also one, and this four is like, you know, what's up, right? So you could create a lookup table from integers to strings for each unique string. That's a thing, or each string, whatever, however you want to do it. And that would still be roughly as space efficient as, as ever, okay? Um, yeah, so this, yeah, and this kind of gets into the notion of compression, right? So if it wasn't, you know, let's say that you had, what, what was an exact sparse matrix that you had, but it was just a repetitive matrix, okay? for strings especially um you know then you could create a lookup table which is like compression that's like the zero or the first order approach for compression is to create a lookup table of strings to um to index and so you can just index those okay that that's essentially yeah that that actually comes up in some ml stuff because um you need to keep track of what words are being used okay and you end up with something like a lookup table, okay? Uh, but yeah, so, but usually, I mean, you can usually convert everything to numbers first and then do everything numerically, okay? Um, all right, so those are, those are sparse matrices. That's that's what we're gonna get out in terms of the, the implementation, okay? And uh, that's, so that's sklearn. That's what sklearn is gonna map from lists of strings, which are dot, uh, a corpus, basically, into a sparse matrix, okay? Now, sklearn does a lot of other stuff. It does it, it'll do k-means clustering, which we're also going to look at. It'll do uh, you know ten or twenty different other types of clustering if you want. Um, it does logistic regressions. It does the kind of like ML like things, but not deep learning. Okay, so uh, but it's still it's very useful. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through an example. Jupiter it's 
using a relatively small corpus tbh but uh it 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 you know it's a stuff that we're kind of familiar with in in many ways uh classic english language novels okay and uh and also i'm going to do a presidential inaugural speeches which is pretty fun um so we're going to use those as two two examples of corpora and uh yeah so i have a github repo this one's in it's on text analysis github so here you can see if you just want to look at it you can go over to github it'll generate a um, jupiter output so this is you won't be able to run anything but you can at least look at what's happening there okay uh if you want to run it i mean you should already have python installed so you, sh you should be able to run that you should be able to go here and clone this repository or download it and run it yourself if you if you can't for whatever reason there's also this binder thing um wherein uh it'll spin up a notebook server for you on the cloud and and serve it to you and you can just run stuff there that that's a little slower okay it doesn't always work 100 percent, but it it usually does okay so um yeah, so I'm, not, I'm gonna I'm just gonna write it on my own computer. Okay, so here's what we're doing. Now this, where are we at? Text analysis. Okay, shut that down. Um, so we don't really need that, but you no, know, you know, let's just do this and I'm not scaring things. Okay, so also let me. It's a little bigger. Okay, and uh, yeah, let's do that. Now. start fresh start okay so here you can see we're importing numpy pandas sklearn just the feature extraction part you can you can just import like parts of the library so feature extraction that the feature is like mapping from the the heterogeneous data into like specific numbers so how many times do you see this or like you know some some more numerical property of, of whatever raw data you're looking at okay so that's that's what they mean by feature extraction and then nltk the natural language toolkit import those plotting stuff so matplotlib you probably know seaborn is like a it's like the next level up in terms of abstraction it sits on top makes pretty graphs and this is making sure that the plots are big enough for our purposes okay so then now what we're going to do is download um a, a small sample of the the project gutenberg corpus so uh project gutenberg is just they take um books that are in the public domain which happens after uh so in the u.s it's about 1000 centuries or technically speaking i think a lot of years like 80 years or something after either the publication or in many cases the death of the author so it's a long time but you get stuff you got your Bronte sisters, you got your uh, Alice in Wonderland. I mean, we'll see in a second what you have. You got a lot of stuff. The classics. Um, so this, 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 I've already downloaded it, but this, if you didn't, if you hadn't already downloaded it, it would download it into your NLTK data directory. Okay. So that does that. Um, and now we're going to see what we have. So this, this downloaded it. Okay. And then, then what here is basically um, NLTK Corpus Gutenberg file IDs. So this is going to get the, the IDs of all those books. Okay. Um, which is like the tags, the names basically. And then, and then we're going to print those out, uh, without the extension, I guess. I don't really know. So, but you can see Jane Austen, Emma, Jane Austen, Persuasion, Jane Austen, Sense and Sensibility, the King James Bible, Blake poems, Anthony Burgess, Buster Brown, not Anthony Burgess. He did Clockwork Orange, the other one. Uh, Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland. I don't really know the other ones. I know Moby Dick, Paradise Lost, and some Shakespeare and, and Whitman. Okay, so some people wrote some books. We have them. And then uh, next one, this is going to – so this, you know, this is like that list comprehension, right? So books is the list of IDs, okay? Um, and uh, we're doing this list comprehension for each book. There's just like this open thing. So it's like under Gutenberg, it'll like this, like open that file, wherever that file is. It keeps track of where those files are and you just say open it and then that creates a file object and then read will return the, the value of that. Okay, so I text now is a list of strings. Each string is a book. So the strings are quite long, okay? This is a weird, 
corpus because we have entire books, but we only have like 20 of them. Okay. But all of the Gutenberg corpus would have entire books and all of the books, like a lot of books. Okay. So do that. It takes like half a second. Uh, we're printing out number 12. That happens to be a movie dick for particular characters. I just picked out something so we can see what's going on. Clearly, this is Moby Dick. Okay. Um, that That's classic uh, Herman Melville. Okay. Um, now, uh, what can we do with that? Well, we can we can do a first, first order analysis and just look at the length. Okay. So if you, each of these is a string, right? So we can find the length for each of those strings. So for each X in text. So text is a list of strings. For each X, we find the line length of that in, in terms of characters. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we could do, if you want to do words, right, you could do, uh, something like this. Okay. And then we could throw that in here. And then I really, we should call this characters. Okay. Do this and then that. Okay, so this is going to, um, we have 17 books, 18 books. Okay, and so the, what we're saying is first find the length of the string so that will give you the number of characters. Here we're saying, okay, take X, split, splits it, splits each string into a list of strings by a particular delimiter. And by default, that delimiter is any white space. So space, tab, return, carriage return, weird other white space characters that it knows about. Um, and it's so it'll split into words for a normal use case and, and lines. Okay. And then we just look at the length of that string, which is the number of words. Okay. So now um you can see uh well okay I mean they're they're big. Okay. Um you look at the King James Bible, it's four million characters, eight hundred and twenty one thousand words. So there's a lot going on here. All right, a lot of words. Uh yeah, and then you can you could look at other stuff, right? Um, you could look at the number of unique words. I think I might actually do that later on. Um, let me just double check. Yeah, yeah. I, I look at the number of unique words later on. So let, let's just keep it at this for now because we can be smarter once we go to the text vectorization techniques. Okay. So let's, ju let's just keep it at this for now. This is our, our summary of all of these. Okay. And, but I guess, you know, it, you, you can do simple stuff at this point. You can say, what's the, um, what's the average length of a word would be info, uh, word length on average would be info cares it's the number of characters over the number of words. Okay. They're all pretty similar. It's about 5.5. Okay. I guess the longest coming in looks like Milton paradise lost. Yep. Just barely edging out Moby Dick and then Whitman's gonna have a close third there. Okay. So that's a, that's, that's average word length. That's, that's going to be different from a uh, number of unique words per word. Right, so number of unique per words per words is a measure of like complexity, which might be a little better. Okay, so let's let's wait until we get to the vectorization approach. It's it's faster. Okay, um, okay, so now we can vectorize. We're going to vectorize. So what we do is first remember FE was that um, feature extraction, the text module for feature extraction. Okay, FE is just a module, Python like sub module kind of thing that contains different functions like count vectorizer just counts up the number of words and returns a sparse vector with those word is exactly what we did in the slides. Uh, there's TFIDF vectorizer, which is down here, which is the next one down there, um, which does that and normalizes by document inverse document frequency. Okay. So, uh, but first if we do, what we do is first we create the vectorizer. So this creates a vectorizer. It's a thing. It's an object that vectorizes stuff. So you create vec count, and that's an object that like does vectorizing stuff. And then you do vect count fit transform on your corpus text, which is a list of strings. And then count will thus be a sparse matrix. Okay. And then that's going to have a shape. Okay. 
the shape of the sparse matrix is always that returns is always the number of documents in the rows and then the tokens and the columns, the, the words basically in the columns. Okay. And here we didn't, there are a bunch of options that you can give to convectorizer. So you could say what this is, this is looking for single words. If we want to do two or three grams, we could tell it to do that. Just right out of the box. You say, do, do one, two and three grams. Very simple. It's built in. Okay. Um, you can tell it to ignore certain words. Uh, it'll have a default list of English words that are not interesting um, and so on. So it has a bunch of options that you can throw at it too. Okay. Um, but this one, we just gave it the defaults and, um, and now there's this fit transform. What is fit transform? Well, it fits and it transforms. Okay. And what does that mean? Well, th these are two separate operations, which often you will do at the same time and just do fit transform, but sometimes you may want to do separately. Okay. So fit, what fit does is it, it deals with the issues of the vocabulary. Remember we talked about what do you want to include in your vocabulary? You might want to discard these really common words. You might want to not discard them and just downweight them and so on. Okay, so um, fit looks at it and says, decides what the vocabulary is, right? So if it's really simple, let's say, look at every unique word and put that in your vocabulary. But sometimes you might say, well, if a word is in every document, let's not include that. It's, it's not an interesting word. If it's in more than 90% of documents, let's not include it, okay? If it's in only one document, maybe it's a typo. Maybe we should exclude it, okay? So you can set these thresholds either in proportionate or absolute numbers of documents, terms. Um, and fit will will take all those options in and create a vocabulary for you. Okay, then transform is the second step. It it says okay, given we have a vocabulary, uh, let's transform this these documents into actual vectors. Okay, so fit decides on the vocabulary. Transform creates the vectors themselves. Here we we want to do both right off the bat. So so we just do there's a the convenience function called fit transform, but it's the same as if you called fit and then transform on text. Okay. That gives us the, the sparse matrix. It has shape and doc and toke. So here I'm just printing out and doc and n toke 18 documents and 42,063 tokens. So 42,063 unique words appear in these books. Okay. Um, I mean, you see the total number of words is much higher than that, but we're talking unique words, okay? Because there's a lot of repetition. Okay, so that's kind of vectorizer. We can do TFIDF vectorizer, okay? Um, so the first thing is, um, so TFIDF vectorizer, you can turn off TFIDF, and if you turn off TFIDF like I did here, use, use IDF equals false, that does give you a, f a frequency. And I, gave, I told it to do the L1 norm. So what does that mean? That means, don't normalize based on working frequency and, and don't do L2 normalization, do L1. So L1 is you just divide by the sum. L1 means the vector sums to one, okay? Um, so this is literally frequencies. That's, this is the, how you would do frequencies. This is giving you word frequencies. And then the final step is to do uh, same thing, but without those options, this is gonna do TFIDF L2 normalized. These things we can put right into the ma we can matrix multiply right away and it'll give us a similarity that's between zero and one. Okay, that's not true for these others. Okay. Um, all right, so now this is, you know, this, now that's where we can, we can do some, some wild stuff with these matrices. So, so TFIDF now is a matrix, it's a sparse matrix with L2 normalized um, vectors that are weighted appropriately with TFIDF. Okay. Um, so we can do the similarity matrix thing. We can multiply, remember TF, the, the shape of the matrix is n doc times n toque. So if you do the matrix times the matrix transpose, you get n doc by n doc, which is document to document, okay? We can do that. So simil will then turn into a matrix of size n doc, n doc, which so that's gonna be 18 by 18 in our case. Um, and then match show, match show just visually plots a matrix and gives you a little color bar uh, to show you the values, okay? And you have to tell it to, to display the color bar. Okay, so we do that. Um, now here, um, um, that's fine. The pictures are the the plots are a little blurry because I set the 
no, 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 this is blurry because I'm zooming. Okay, but at least it's bigger. So uh, this this gives you an 18 by 18 matrix that we're visualizing. You can see um, one corresponds to bright yellow, and that's one along the diagonals. By construction, you're comparing a document with itself. It has to be one. Um, and then the, the gradations there thereafter are from actual document similarities. Okay, and so from here you can see, just just reading off. I mean, you can see. There's a cluster, probably eight through 12, eight, nine, 10, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 are all kind of similar to each other. Okay. Same is true of one, two, zero, one, two, and three, four, five. Okay. So eight, eight through 12, let's see what eight through 12 is. So that's all the Chesterton and I guess Edgeworth and Moby Dick are similar. Okay. You can see the Austin, Jane Austen uh, books, one, zero, one, two, are, have that you know linkage there. Um, and then the next three do too. Uh, these King James Bible, Blake is, is very probably biblical, I would think. Um, and I'm not sure about the third one. They're similar. Okay, and then also five is similar to that 812 block for some reason. Okay, so I'm less... Or not, yeah, five is, yeah. So I, I don't know why that is, but yeah, it's similar. And then, uh, so is the last one, 18 women. Okay, so you can see that at least the Austins, the Chestertons are grouped together. Okay. Um, now we can do other stuff. Okay. We can look at um, like closest similarity. Okay. So here we need to kind of work through it one step at a time. So what are we going to do? Uh, so that simil matrix, right? That's got all the similarity values. If you do, there's a thing called, well, you can sort stuff, right? By the, the value, we could do that. But if you sort it, you, you, you lose track of the indices, okay? Because these are ordered uh, by the, the index of the book. If you do arg sort, it'll give you the index order. So it'll say, what's the... What's the index of the highest value? What's the index of the next highest value? And so on. Okay. So that's what sim sort is. And it's going to sort it along the horizontal axis. Okay. And then now when you do arg sort, the it's going to sort from lowest to highest, ascending order. Okay. The last one will always be one because you've included the book itself. That's a one. Okay. So we don't want to get that one. We want to get the second highest, which is the closest one that is not the actual book itself. So we go. Vertically, we're looking through every book, and then horizontally, we're looking for the closest book that's not the book itself, so the second last element. That's what close is getting. Um, and then we're, we're going through and picking up the actual similarity value. So like for book zero, we get close zero. For book one, we get close one, and so on. Okay, And then we're just putting the, the name of the book, the closest ID, and the similarity in there and then we join in the, the name of the closest one okay so we were kind of collecting things together and then joining in the actual name okay so th the reason we have to do it like this is we have this numeric matrix we have indices which correspond to the book names and we just have to join those in okay so if we do that then you can see these closest books so it's like the closest book to jane austen's emma is jane austen's is it persuasion or the age of persuasion or I forget what the name of the book is called. Um, let's find out. Maybe it's just persuasion. Persuasion novel. Um, so then, Austin persuasion is closest to Edgeworth's parents. Austin's sense, you would sense and sensibility. It's close to persuasion. So it's like it's not like. Um, how should I say this? Uh, it's not necessarily bilateral. So you can see that like sense and sensibility is close to persuasion, but the closest one's persuasion is Edgeworth, not even Austin, right? So it's not like necessarily bilateral in this, this similarity um, because it's a higher dimensional space. And yeah, and then you can see anything else interesting. Chesterton similar to themselves uh, as is Moby Dick. Shakespeare is always similar to himself. Um, 
So it's Caesar to Hamlet, Hamlet to Macbeth, Macbeth to Hamlet. Okay, so I don't know. At least within Austin and Shakespeare, it's close, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah. So if we want to do, so that's what we can do kind of with that similarity matrix, okay? If we want to do stuff where we're actually looking at, sort of like within book at um, the the sort of statistics on word usage, okay? There we can, you know, you can, you can look at a couple different things and you can, you can, if you're clever, you can implement it with uh, kind of just kind of linear algebra-ish stuff or vectorized stuff at least, okay? So, so let's look at, um, so we have count. Count is the number of instances that it, of that word, okay? Uh, and then usage is going to be the binarization of that. So we're saying, um, is it positive or not? Okay, so we, we, we say, is this positive or not? That's going to return a Boolean. I'm going to turn it into an integer because it just it just plays nicer with other stuff. Having Boolean types is, is gets a bit weird sometimes. Okay, so we're going to keep it as an integer. And then you can also look at um, the vocabulary. This is the number of words that they use, right? So this is saying take that usage matrix, which is now just 0, 1, and sum it along the the, ax, the, 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 the horizontal axis, the, the word axis. So for each book, we're going to get the total number of distinct words that are used, which is what we were talking about before, but now we've implemented it in terms of vectors. Okay, so, um, and then get a one, basically that's going to return, a this is going to return a matrix, but it's like a an n by one matrix, or k by one matrix, or n by one. And so this is going to turn it into a, a, a 1D array. It's just a funny little function that you can do. Um, the other thing we can do is I'm going to, I th this is something like what's called a diversity index, which is actually basically mathematically equivalent to uh, the Herfindahl index, I think, um, where you, you just take the word frequencies and square them and sum them. Okay. So if you, Let me think. Imagine, so imagine you only used one word. You just said the word the constantly. Then your your word vector would just be a bunch of zeros and then one in terms of frequency would be one for the and zero for everything else. Um, and when you square that and sum it, you get one, okay? So really, this is like inverse diversity in some sense. Um, so you square it, you sum it across the word axis, you get one. If you used every word equally, well then, you, every every element would be one over n, which would turn into one over n squared. When you square it, we sum it, then you get back one over n because you get n over n squared. So you get one over n. So so if you use every word equally, you get one over n, which is going to be close to zero. Uh, if you use only one word, you get one. So it's like it's like an inverse diversity of word usage matrix. Okay. Um, okay. And then, and then the final thing I do is I wanted to come up with a measure of, of complexity. And so one thing you can do is look at, um, so it, you have a, the notion of the vocabulary, which is the number of distinct words that you use. Uh, and then you also have the notion of um, the length. So the the idea is that like longer books are going to have a larger vocabulary, but that's not it's not clear that that's important, right? I mean, you, you just wrote a longer book and you ended up using more words. What's really I think going to be important is uh, the number of vocabulary, dis the number of distinct words you use divided by something like the length. Okay, it's not clear that. Dividing by the length itself is ideal. Maybe you want to do like square to the length or something like that. Um, so I just did square to the length here, okay? Because like, you're, even if you get longer, I mean, you're going to use some of the old, same old words. And so there's some relationship, which I'm not getting at, which I'm trying to approximate here, okay? And I'm calling that complexity, okay? Length is not defined. I, I renamed length to, I'm going to call it words. I think I renamed it to words. Words was defined as the total number of words you use. So this is distinct words divided by total words. What the hell? Oh, I want to call that words now too. 
We're gonna call that words. We're gonna call this words. Word. Okay. Um, yeah, so now we get the vocabulary. This is the total number of distinct words. Moby Dick blows everyone out of the water. But Moby Dick is also a really long book, okay? Um, but you can also see that, like, KG, KJV, King James Bible, is almost a million words. It's it's four times longer than Moby Dick, but it uses less total words. So clearly, according to any whatever, whatever metric of complexity you use, Moby Dick is more complex than the King James Bible, for instance, in terms of word usage. Um, the other ones are much shorter, you know? So it's like this one is Ells Edgeworth is shorter in terms of words but also in terms of vocab it's not clear how do you weight those things and to to make it make sense okay so i don't know um yeah but then if you look at the diversity index with the square root of the length okay so uh remember higher there also would have existed less words the older the book yeah i mean they're making so yeah i mean Potentially, but also they, you know, words come into existence and generally fall out of it, of usage. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, you'd imagine Shakespeare created a lot of words. You know, there probably were a lot of words in the King James Bible that are, are not commonly used now that are archaic. So it could go either way, kind of. Also, they like always misspelling words and old stuff. So, um yeah, but I, I think, yeah, there's going to be some systematic trends. We, we actually know the dates of when these are published, too. So we can we can try and look at control for that, potentially. Okay. The other thing is, like, you know, for if you, if you just take this, uh, okay, let's, 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 like, mm, let's, let's just call it DF, why not? Okay, so we're going to call this DF and just print it out. So now we can do other stuff with it. Um, you know, the general idea behind this complexity thing, though, is that, the, you know, there's that you have the number of distinct words and the total number of words. And there's some relationship there. Okay, so one thing you could do is um, uh, do a joint plot, which is, this is like a scatter plot, basically. We could just do a scatter plot of uh, log of words and log of vocab okay so here we're, we're doing um this scatter plot all right you can see that there, there's a clear positive relationship between these things all right the longer the book the the um the larger the number of distinct words there's some you could estimate a regression slope which would I mean, it's pretty high R squared, actually. Okay, you can see this is KJV, right? KJV is super long, but kind of below trend for complexity. Okay, so if you, if you thought there was a, a linear relationship in the logs between these things, you could use the the distance that it was off of that best fit line as some measure of complexity. So these are the relatively more complex books. These are the relatively less complex books. Okay. Now, maybe you think that there's some nonlinear, I mean, usually in logs, things get pretty linear. Kind of like the physics approach, they always just they're all about the linear in logs. Maybe you want to say that, okay? And in some sense, the KGV is less complex, okay? Um, yeah, so that that would be a more sophisticated measure is looking at the residual after a log 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 regression, okay? Um, okay, so what else can we do? We can we can do other stuff. You can do a million things. I'll just go through some examples. You can do an overlap matrix. So, th so this is another notion of similarity, which takes, it's like an extensive margin notion of similarity. It's just saying, take that usage matrix, which is just a zero, zero, one integer, binary integer thing, uh, and look at the product. So now it's saying, what fraction of words do both books use? Do they, is there a lot of overlap in the word usage that they have? Okay, but but only on the extensive margin, not in the intensive margin. And then you, you can get this. You get something pretty similar. I mean, uh, 12. So so the 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 the, the identity column here, um, or the diagonal, whatever it's called, um, that thing, 
Uh, that's not going to be one anymore because it depends on how many words you use in total also. So maybe we want to normalize that out, but um, you can still see the, the sort of Austin Chesterton clusters showing up there, which is not surprising. Okay. Um, all right. I pulled in pub year. We were talking about pub year. I pulled it in. Um, you know, K King James Bible, I put in 1611 because yeah, but the, obviously that's got a complicated history um, in terms of when everything was actually written and translated and transcribed. But, you know, let's just say it's 1611. Okay, that was when actually the, the KGB was formally published. Um, everything else I think is more straightforward uh, in terms of when it was published. Okay. Um, and so then we can do... Right. Um, here's what I did. Years here, I created a thing called years. So first I, I created a mapping between these IDs uh, and the year. Okay, these are like the IDs that, it, that, that they use internally and the year is published. Then I just, what I did is just turn that into a vector with the same order as, as we've been using so far for that zero to 18 or zero to 17, okay? And so when I do that, if I if I create this thing, so this is like, this is creating a matrix. Like, I don't know if you've seen, you might not have seen this NumPy notation, NumPy notation before, but like you, you if you put none in an indexer, it creates a new uh, length one dimension, basically. So, so I said, this is just like taking the, the dot difference, not like the outer product, but in differences. And so it'll tell you in matrix form, uh, what is the year differential between the publication of those two books? Now the similarity matrix is already, it's already matrix telling us the similarity between each of those books. What we do is we just flatten both of those and this is gonna, we're plotting the year differential between publication and the similarity. So these are books that were published around the same time. Okay, the, this, the reason there are more here is because we're looking at pairs. This is, um, this is, there's 18 squared uh, dots here. So that's the thing. Um, these are published around the same time Okay, and then these are like 300 years apart. So this would be like, uh, the earliest ones are like Shakespeare. So it's like the Shakespeare's versus these Chesterton other ones. Okay, that's that's like almost 300 years. Okay, so um, yeah. So, but you can see, I mean, there, there's a negative trend. It's pretty noisy. There's a negative trend, which which you would expect, right? So that's a thing that's out there. So you can do you can do analyses like that, which is kind of like what what uh, what David was saying, right? So um, okay, uh, we can cluster. We can do the old k-means clustering um, if we want. So so here we have so our our document vectors are are forty six thousand dimensional vectors. Okay, in that whatever space, we want to cluster those into whoever is. We want to cluster those. I'm, I'm saying use try and do four clusters. Okay, so I'm saying k-means create a k-means cluster that does four clusters, and then here's the same thing. We fit it, which fit doesn't do much here, but you still have to kind of do it. And then predict is more like predict which clusters these things are in. So for each of these 18 books, we're going to get a cluster number. Okay, um, and then we're just printing that out. Okay, so you can see it's zero through three, so four total clusters. Essentially, Austin and Edgeworth could put in cluster one. All the sort of biblical stuff gets kind of cluster. Austin gets cluster zero. Biblical stuff gets cluster one. Shakespeare, he's got his own cluster, cluster number two. And then Burgess Buster Brown is just out there. Actually, that's a children's book, so it's in its own cluster too. So, um, yeah, not bad, I would say. Um, you know, so the, the, but you can see that you, you have to choose the number of clusters in that. I mean, if I do five, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's pretty slow. Um, so you get your Austins. And basically, it breaks up the biblical one. No. Oh, I already changed. You get Austin plus some other stuff. You get Chesterton and Shakespeare, Chesterton and, and Moby Dick. You get another Shakespeare cluster, again, like really biblical stuff, and then Buster Brown. Okay, so that actually, that was pretty good, I think. Um, but, but, you know, there is, you know, not obvious always what the optimal number of clusters is. Okay. Um, he is pure. Yep. Shakespeare is in a class of his own. Okay. Um, so yeah. And then uh, I imported PCA here. PCA is a, 
principal component analysis. That's a dimensionality reduction technique. Um, I guess I could, that's gonna map, these are 46,000 dimensional vectors. What if we wanna map those into a lower dimensional space so us mortals, other than David, of course, can, can visualize them, okay? Uh, so, so there, um, you can always do question mark on something and it'll give you the help. That's very useful. You can do double question mark and it'll give you the source. So um, if we want to do that, okay, uh, well, um, we're going to go, I'm going to go a little bit longer. I'm not going to do a half and half thing here with the split because I'll just finish this and then we can break and then do a shorter second half. Okay. So um, the PCA, okay, you give the number of dimension, number of components. Okay. So... This is the the number of components that you wanted to spit out. So I think we want to do two here. Do tap completion two. Uh, it's two. Uh, I don't really know what whitening is. It's um, I think it's like adding noise or something. Or no, maybe it's the way you normalize. I'm not sure. Um. Yeah, and there's other stuff. This is a pretty complicated thing to do. So uh, let's just do that. Let's do PCA equals that, and then. Um, I think we want to do fit. There's often examples too. Examples are nice. I don't, you know, just tell me how to do it, man. You know, so, so you do PCA components equals two, um, and then fit. Okay. And then there's also transform. There should be like a fit transform notion. Okay. But if, if you if you don't know what to do, you can always just do this, like make it, and then try to tap complete on stuff, which of course doesn't work here. Fit, okay, it has fit. It has fit transform. I think this is what we want. So we wanna, we wanna give, uh, yeah, let's give it our TF-IDF. So we're gonna give our, TF, our, our TF-IDF corpus, okay, and then uh, dimension to, Corpus, that's a thing. Of course, it didn't like that. Oof. Doesn't support sparse input. That's not cool. Oh, we could just do too dense. Okay, so we, as much as I hate to do things inefficiently, PCA doesn't support sparse inputs. So I had to convert it to a dense matrix and then run that. So it's, it's, too dense is inefficient. It, it, it makes a huge number of zeros, but we only have 18 books, so we can do whatever we want. Um, if we had like a real honker of a corpus, then your computer might blow up if you tried to do that. Okay, so you want to be careful. Um, but here, here we don't have to be careful. Now, with this, these are this. We we went from 46,000 dimensions to two dimensions. That's pretty good. Okay, now we just have to plot those. Um, now this 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 returned an array, a two D array of you know eighteen by two, which is the components we wanted to get out, right? So it fit it, then it transformed them from forty six thousand dimensions to two dimensions, and that's what D two corp is. Um, now we want to scatter plot this. One thing you can do is star. If you if you use star, it'll. Um, I think we need to do transpose. So so if you transpose it, it'll be two by whatever, and if you use star, it'll give it each one of those individually, um, which it'll give it X and Y basically. Okay, and then let's, yeah. So <clears throat> that's what it is. I mean, I don't know what is what, so it's kind of tough. So so we, we probably wanna at least create a data frame here, right? Where we pull in those names, right? So this would create the names, okay? And then, um, PCA X is going to be D2 corp uh, column zero. And then PCA Y is going to be two corp D2 corp uh, column one. Okay. So, so now we can kind of piece together, like if we were really smart, I'd like create text labels here and we can do that, but we don't have time for that. We can piece together, like what are these folks out here? X greater than 0.3 is a, is a thing. Okay x greater than 0.3, y 
You guessed it. I'm sure Shakespeare is out, way out there on his own. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, you can also, like, if you want to split it just heuristically, why less than 0.2 between 0.2 and 0.3? Um, Whitman and Blake and by so that's that's super biblical stuff I'd characterize as super biblical um and then the higher values for 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 y is another interesting area above 0.2 I'd say is uh the Austins okay you get your Burgess your Buster Brown that's that's all four of them yeah and then then sort of close close up near there is, is going to be Edgeworth uh probably and then there's this one that's the opponent I can't, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Okay. So yeah. Um, that's what we got. Uh, I think that that's, that makes sense. Okay. And then you could cluster these two, right? So instead of doing K means on the 46,000 dimensional space, you could cluster it on this and it'd probably give you similar stuff. It certainly would, would get the Shakespeare, right? Probably get the Austin, right? And so on. Okay. So, but this stuff's a little grouped together. So I, I don't know. Um, but that's kind of cool. You can you can visualize it too, right? Um, okay, so that's actually let's not, let's let's take a break here because now we just finished up with all the books. Now we can do the inaugural stuff, okay? Um, and then so th this is cool. I mean, th th this one I think we you can get a better idea and you can do a little bit more interesting stuff, and it kind of relates to current events once you get towards the end, right? So um, let's take let's let's pop out for ten and. Uh, I'll see you. I'll see you at uh, four. Let's do four forty. Okay, we'll do twelve. All right, um, and then yep. See you then.
All righty. <clears throat> Welcome back. Here we are. Um, okay. Uh, so I guess we're going to, we're going to keep on going here with the uh, text analysis stuff. So now we can, we're going to do, we're going to do something similar for, for inaugural speeches. So we, I mean, we kind of already know all the individual steps. We're just applying it to a new corpus. So I'm not going to go through the, the tech details on that, but you know, we can, we can look at the output and see if there's anything different that we can do. So the, the, the one thing is, well, first of all, the steps are the same, basically NLTK download inaugural. That'll give you all the inaugurals up to, you know, the most recent one, 2016. Uh, so these are, these are just for some background every time a president takes office they give a speech at the beginning um an inaugural speech wherever you know usually it's at the the, the capitol building um uh in dc um and this is just the text of that speech okay um so if you remember 2016 that's when trump gave his inaugural the american carnage inaugural and so on i believe that's the only instance of the the word carnage in inaugural okay um so let's look at that. So you, if you load in NLTK, uh, same thing, load in these file IDs, get the, we actually just get the year directly because it has the year and the ID. So we know exactly which year this was. I mean, in the name, um, oh yeah, Harrison, Harrison did it in the rain. He got, I think pneumonia probably a month after and died in office. I think before, possibly before he was, no, no he was inaugurated and then yeah, he died a month in office. So. Yeah, don't end up like, like uh, I assume, William Henry Harrison. There might be multiple Harrisons, but don't end up like that. Um, so we can we can load this in. Uh, vectorizing stuff, same same process. Count vectorize. Um, get the number of docs and tokens. So here we have 50 documents and a total of 9,168 words used. Okay. Then we do the freak, the pure frequency. That's, that's no TFIDF L1 normalized pure word frequency. Then we do TFIDF. Okay, so from here we can do the same sort of steps. We look at that similarity matrix by multiplying the matrices together uh, with themselves. Okay, and so you can see a lot of you can't see mother. Okay, that's turning into a problem. Me forgetting to do that. Okay, everything was the same. Let me go through it again though. Um, download, read in the the files. Okay, just like we did before and then get the years and just the length of the inaugural for, for later. Uh, count vectorize, and here, here we see that number of documents is 58. Once we get out that matrix back, uh, count, we can see that the, um, or inaug count, uh, we can see that uh, number of documents is 58 and the number of tokens is 9,168. TFIDF vectorize with, with just a frequency and then do the real TFIDF vectorize. And then finally we get um, the uh, similarity matrix, which we plot here, okay, just like before, but now we have we have uh, 58 inaugurals, 58 presidents, okay, um, like 58 terms, I guess there were some, some people do two terms, three, wait, who did, did someone did, someone did three, right, it was, uh, maybe not, maybe it was two, whatever. Um, so you can see a lot of, mostly yellow here where they're similar, to each other okay you can see some interesting outliers where it's very it's more in the probably 0.6 region rather than like say the 0.8 or 9 region okay so there's a lot of homogeneity in here kind of between these uh clusters okay died in his fourth term was that fdr yeah. Oh, yeah. You said that. Okay. FDR. Yeah. So yeah. Then then after that, then there was only only two term presidents because that was became law or something. So um, so you can see the outliers. Uh, first one with the biggest outlier actually is is Washington. So that you can see that this is number one and number two. Washington was number one and number two. Okay. So uh, first inaugural, he said some stuff which was similar, and the second inaugural, fairly different, very different from everything else. Okay. Then you can see there's one here and one here. Um, and then that to say, actually, 
from this point onward, something happened. So, so the, 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 but the, these these three bands are, are sort of the most prominent ones, um, and we'll see who, who those are. Okay, so uh, so the first one that what the second Washington second inaugural. It turns out that that one was just very short. They're they're um, the length is. I mean, they're usually pretty long, but he was just like, "Hi, I'm here again. Let's not get too crazy about this." Okay, uh, that's all. All right, so it just it was just very short, um, and so it wasn't similar to the others. Okay, so that because because there was not much word of that because he didn't really say anything. Okay, um, okay. The other thing we can do is the same thing we did before. The uh, you look at the year differential between each of the inaugurals and then look at their um, uh, similarity. Okay, so first. Okay, at year at zero one, th this is just every the ones we're comparing to themselves. Okay, so this is just to show you what we're doing here. This is creating the year differential, creating the similarity, and then uh, this joint plot is this is a seaborne thing. This this is uh, it, it'll do a scatter plot, and then also the marginal PDFs on the axes. So this is the PDF for year difference, and this is the PDF for uh, similarity. Okay, and then it does like a hex scatter i told it to a hex scatter in the middle so you can see if you do a regular scatter things pile up on top of each other if you do a hex you can see the actual density in 2d so um you can see this this is just comparing presidents inaugurals with themselves but then you can also see i mean there's kind of a falling away here so the the larger the differential the more different the the lower the similarity which is what we would expect okay um you can look at uh who Here's what we're doing here. <clears throat> we're constructing a data frame. Uh, which has, pre Prez is just the name, the tag name. So it's like 1973. That was Washington's uh, second inaugural. That was the outlier. Okay. And then what we're doing is looking at that similarity and looking at the mean inaug sim similarity is this this matrix here. So we're looking at the mean across with everyone else. So it's how how similar are you on average to everyone else? Okay. And then, so, so that's going to be at the president level too, with the term president level. And then we're just sorting it by the lowest to highest. Okay. So we can, this is detecting those outliers basically. So you can see Washington, this is index number one, Washington second inaugural, second inaugural. Roosevelt 45, that's World War II. Okay. He was obviously dealing with, with some stuff there. Okay. Uh, Lincoln, 65, Civil War, also dealing with some stuff there. Trump, 2017, 17, actually came in at number four, right behind those two sort of major war associated ones, and then also Bush. So you can see there's a little bit of recency bias here in the sense of, um, not in the behavioral sense, but in the sense that uh, kind of things were like more homogenous, I guess. And, the, and so the recent ones are, are very dissimilar from the older ones. So you're seeing a lot of modern presidents showing up here. It's not until you outside of a wartime situation that you get to, well, actually Grant was too, but that you get to um, something like a, a 19th century president. Okay. So you might, you might really want to do, um, you could actually, you know, you, let's see, what, what could you do? So like if, if you if you might do you want to do like a rolling mean, basically. So if you if you make a data frame out of this thing here, okay, the uh, the similarity matrix, okay, you can do like rolling. Look at like ten around it and look at the mean. So you're looking at like um, the how similar are you to the prior ten presidents, speechwriters. I guess they are speechwriters that that write it. Yeah. Um, so how similar are you to the the prior ten presidents? Okay, and then is that what I want? So. I think. And then we want to, I guess we want to take off the, so this one is saying for the ninth president, how similar are you to 
the ten that came or the the ten that came before you. Okay. So I guess we want. Yeah, it's not clear that we can do this. Um, Yeah, maybe more. And, and if, yeah, we can we can look at that later. Okay, if we have time, All right? So, but you you really want to do something like how different are you from the ones that came just before you? Okay, so let me let me think about that. Um, the other thing you can do is also what we did before is calculate um, these different statistics. So you can look at uh, word usage, okay, and then and calculate the total the total number of words that they've used, okay, and then that, that diversity of word usage. Okay, um, and so maybe you want to look <clears throat> over time. Okay, at the uh, uh, you want to look over time at the vocabulary, the number of words, the distinct word that words that they used. Okay, and uh, you can do that too. All right, um, and you don't see much of a trend. I mean, you kind of see like there's a higher variance in the before 1950. Okay, like after 1950, you never go above a thousand. For 1950, you're, you're, you, you do get these folks that are, are going high, but you also get folks that are relatively low. Okay, so it's kind of more tolerance for this more rhetorical flourish or just using different words. So I don't, I don't know who, I mean, the question is who is this right here? And um, I mean, we can, if you wanted to find that, right, you would do like stats, uh, vocab. So this is your vocab, and then you do uh, index max. It's fine the max the index that maximizes the vocab, and then you would address that at that index. So it would look like this. Okay, Harrison forty one. So it was Harrison. I don't know if that was the the one that was was forty. You think Harrison in forty one was when he died? He went out like on top in terms of vocabulary. Uh, let's find out. Yeah, we think so. Um, yeah, he died. He, he, he really went out with a, the bang. He gave a high vocabulary speech and then, uh, yeah, he was trying to prove how manly he was and then he went down. Okay. So, you know, these things happen. Um, so that's kind of interesting. You got, you got like a big outlier there. Okay. But then you also have variation therein. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, so I guess, you know, the, so the other thing you might want to do is like, let's say we wanted to do that, um, the the rolling mean thing. Okay, so so what you would want to do is say like, you want to get, we have we have a nog similarity. Okay, that's our inaugural sim, or similarity matrix, which is 58 by 58, okay? And so, so for instance, for for the tenth president, okay, you would want to look at like ten, row row number ten, okay, and then from zero to so this is going to be like, um, not this is not going to include ten, okay. So you'd look at this and the mean, okay, and that gives you the the similarity between president number ten and the previous ten is is eighty two percent. Okay, um, and now in general, okay, you would want to do for you know president number i, you would want to go from i minus ten to i. Okay, so let's just test that out with i equals um, twenty. You, you, you can't could do before ten. Okay, and so you get seventy nine. Okay, and for like i equals ten, you get again eighty two. Okay, so this works. All right, and then so we want to do that. Uh, for I in, so, so you got to start at 10 and then you, you go up to 58, actually plus one to, to get all the way. All right. So you do this. Apparently not. Okay. Let's try that. Okay. So that's, that'll get you, you know, from president 10 onwards. Okay. Um, So then, then the matter it's just a matter of creating a data frame. 
you just have to make sure it lines up. So what we're going to do is say, this is your um, local similarity. Okay. Uh, we got to get your name. Okay. And the names, let me just check what the names are called or prez. Cause it's called prez. We're going to do prez. And then we just have to make sure that we only do this from 10 onwards. Cause that's all we can calculate. Okay. And then we're going to do this. Maybe it works. It worked. Um, so it's going to look like that, like that. Okay. And you can do that, you know, you can, um, you know, local similarity. And I, actually we have years, I think. I calculated prez year. That's called, uh, inog years. And then again, from 10 onwards. Okay. And then let's, let's set the indexes here. Okay, so now we have this, we can plot it. Okay, so this is saying retrospectively for the previous 10 presidents, okay? Um, and you know, you can even do like, if we wanna change up the lag, we just replace all these tens with lag here, like that. So we can change that. Okay, so this is for, for previous 10 presidents. That's like 40 years. Maybe Let's do maybe the previous five. Okay, so you can see there's kind of more persistence in a sense. Okay, so um, this is probably because of Washington, even though Washington was skipped, like you're still comparing him to Washington. Um, then for this one though, sort of like very similar. And then uh, Lincoln, right? not only a wartime president, but also fairly kind of distinct in his, in his speech patterns. Then it's just like recovering from Lincoln, basically, and then back to like whatever, you know, boring dude uh, thing. Um, then, you know, FDR, and then, then it's there's more. It's, you know, what does this mean exactly? That this is lower. It says that there's more movement in the space, which may be high dimensional, right? So there's just like more variation going on. And then Trump, you can see, is relatively low similarity. Okay, so. Uh, at least to, to Obama, I guess. Okay, so you can do stuff like that um, to, to look at the local effects, okay? Um, all right, so then, okay, so I think that's all, right? So we, you know, it's kind of like, this is the stuff that you can do with text analysis, okay? Um, just purely, I mean, in terms of like simple stuff that we know how to do, like just linear algebra and matrix multiplication and all that. Okay, so um, now from here, then then we want to we want to go more in the machine learning direct dimension, okay, um, and, and there, you know, things are going to get uh, more complicated. Okay, so uh, let me, yeah, I mean, let, let me let me let me give you some sort of examples on on where we can go from there. Okay, so I guess. Um, let me, I'm going to go over some of, the, some of the concepts today and then maybe we can go through a notebook next time. Okay. With all the things that we might want to do. Okay. So, um, okay. So this is like machine learning. Okay. So, um, you can't see that. Now you can. All I did was write machine learning. Okay, so uh, yeah, so what, what do we want to do here? We want to, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that we can do, but essentially think about, you know, our input generally is going to be the same. Well, not exactly. So so our, our input depends on, so, so one thing is, you know, word order is going to be important, okay? So, or like, we, it may be important, it may not, okay? So if 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 we um, if we do the so-called bag of words, okay, then we're ignoring word order, okay, and that that's that's text vectorization, right? So we just have, um, you know, a bunch a uh, word frequency vector for each uh, document, okay. Um, so so if we do that, okay, and we want to we want to use machine learning techniques, okay? Essentially there, we're gonna be looking at something like classification, okay? So um, 
So let's say let's uh, what's good notation. I don't. Let's just do x. Okay, let's do x uh, as our vector, and we're not even going to write it. We're, we're going to assume we know that it's a vector. So we're going to do like x i. Okay. Um, all right, and then let's even let's even just call these then x i one and x i two. Okay. So we're going to do x i one, x i two, and so on. Okay. Um, up to x i k. So this is going to be like size k, and then i is you know some number from one to n. Okay. Um, so that that's going to I mean basically x is going to represent our, our document uh, corpus, our document matrix. Okay. Um, all right. So then in terms of in terms of classification, okay, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different stuff you can do. Okay. I mean, in, you know, some of it, it ranges from really stuff that's just basically econometrics up, up through the chain to machine learning. So, I mean, you got, you could do, you know, logistic regression. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, you know, that's, that's basically something where, uh, uh the probability of being you know, for I of being in a yes or like in a class, like is, is this patent related to clean technology or something like that? Um, or is this uh, SEC filing positive? Otherwise it's negative. Okay. Something like that. I mean, you could, what you do there is you, you parameterize a probability as some uh, CDF function. Okay of uh this you know of some weighting matrix times xi okay i guess you should do what the way we'd write it is like xi plus b okay so this is saying you've got weights all right this is the now, so w is um w, w really really w is a, a vector okay uh w is a vector that assigns weights to each word Okay, in this case, um, and then also you have some some intercept. Okay, so essentially like linear regression kind of looking stuff. So you could just write beta um, linear regression and looking stuff. You pipe it through some kind of uh, sigmoid function. Okay, so then this is saying you know you put you put those weights on it. It just ensures that pi is between zero and one. Okay. Um, okay, and so then. And this is this notation is going to carry through to to when we do neural networks, which is why it's a little different from regular regression. Okay, so your data is xi, right? And then you're you're mapping into uh, let's say a classification ci. Okay, and in this case, it's just uh, it's going to be a zero one kind of thing. Okay, so you're mapping in. Mapping from x that vector into classification zero or one. Okay, what we have here is um, the uh, probability. Okay, so if we want to estimate the logistic regression, okay, we need to come up with some objective function or some estimation method. Okay, and so what you can do is just look at uh, likelihood. Okay, so the total likelihood. So I mean the so the, the likelihood for uh what's it let's let's go once at a time. So the total likelihood, what's that? That's that's the product of all the individual likelihoods. Right? Okay. Um and that also implies that the log likelihood log of L, that's the definition, um, is gonna be the sum of the individual LIs, right? So the, you know, here LI is defined to be the log of LI. Okay, so the low, lower, lowercase script L is, is the log of L, the capital L, okay? Um, so, so we're looking at the sum of log likelihood, okay? Now the question is, what is LI? And then once we have LI, we can kind of map back into the full on likelihood, okay? Um, Okay, so so what is the likelihood? It's, it's the probability observing, um, probability of observing uh, 
the data given the parameters. Okay, and given the exogenous is conditional, conditional likelihood. Conditional on XI, what's the likelihood of CI? Okay, so um, what is that? Well, if the, pro the probability of it, it, it okay, so if, if it's CI, Okay, if CI is, is equal to one, okay, then the probability is PI, okay? So that's one thing. If CI is equal to zero, the probability of, of observing that was observing the outcome. So is the, the probability of observing whatever the outcome is. And so it depends on the outcome, right? So if the outcome was CI equals one, the probability was PI. Okay, the outcome was uh, zero, probability is one minus pi. Okay, so the way you can write that is pi time, is pi to the ci times one minus pi to the one minus ci. Okay. Um, all right, so that way if, if ci is one, then the likelihood is pi of observing that data. Uh, and if ci is zero, then the likelihood is one minus pi. Um, all right, and so then this means that li is the log of that is, is uh, ci log pi plus one minus ci log one minus pi. Okay. Um, all right, and then the uh, Let's see, then the, the, the L, which is this, the, the total log likelihood is the sum of all of these, okay? Um, okay, and you can see, I mean, it, you just you just add it up, okay? So what this is, this kind of setup here, so in, in, in I mean, it's, it's maximum, maximum likelihood, right? Um, in, uh, ML land. Okay, this is called categorical cross entropy. Okay. Um, because I don't actually know why, but that's just what they call it. Okay, it, it, I mean, there's It's it's entropy somehow like p when you have these sort of log weighted log things it's related to entropy I don't really know why okay but but that's sort of the objective okay so then um, so basically remember this is in here this is a function you know it's a function of like you know all the x's all the c's I mean it's, it's really a function of x i and c i okay and then also the parameters w and v right so you got the data x i c i and then inside PI is W and V. So you're, you're maximizing over W and V. And, and you know, for, for this one, it's just, it's the whole thing, X and C, the matrix and the, uh, the vector. Okay, so so that's sort of logistic regression. Okay, and, that, and that's, that's something, I mean, you can implement that if you're, if you're in TensorFlow or whatever, you can, you can implement that. Okay, um, and that, that's, uh, yeah, I mean that, that that that's that's like the the thing is that once you get sorry, we'll talk about neural networks I guess in a bit, but once you start getting neural networks, those are look a lot like logistic regressions, but then they get chained together. Okay, so um, but but you know if we if we just start from logistic regressions, logistic regressions, something we kind of understand, and then move on from there. Okay, so um, now the uh, you know the the what I what I wrote here, this is um. Let me get this right. This is I'm 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 denoting some generic sigmoid function, right? So it's like you know, this. I, let me not write of x, but you know this this thing could be phi capital phi, of like z or whatever it is. I mean that could be like you know normal CDF, which doesn't really have a closed form, um, or it could be more you know. In fact, this is what they usually use is um, 
1 over 1 plus e to the minus x, right? So that when x is minus infinity, this goes to 0, and it's plus infinity, it goes to 1, okay? Um, that's the that's the general generally the so yeah, that, that that's legit you know logistic uh, curve and then the the probit is like probit is like I forget it but this is logistic okay so this this is what people usually use okay and this is you know this is equal to e to the x over one plus e to the x also just multiply through okay so um, and then at that actually. That might actually simplify. I think it simplifies this calculation a little bit, but it's not. I don't think it's super important. Um, okay, so that that's what you can do. And now, um, now what we want to do is a couple things. Okay, so one thing is there. There are first of all, even within the econometric side, maximum or not not exactly maximum likelihood, but even within the econometric side, there are different ways. To estimate this okay so one is just what we have here maximum likelihood you literally just find the parameters that maximize the likelihood that's it okay um the other big one so this is like estimation the other big one is so just basically like pure ml that's like a okay um and then b would be what's called lasso okay so with lasso you're, you're actually adding another uh, term to uh, this likelihood, okay? And in particular, um, you're adding a term that kind of looks like lambda times the sum, let me get this right, of, you'd be adding a term times lambda that looks like this. So, so remember that I, call this J. Uh, there's K tokens here or words, right? And so what we're saying is uh, we're going to add a penalization term that looks like this. Not beta. It's, it should be WK. Sorry. Thinking too much econometrics. WK. Right. So you penalize when you penalize it in an absolute value sense. Okay. When the coefficient is positive, okay? So you could imagine, and when zero, you get no penalty. You could imagine doing something like minus the sum of squares of W, okay? Uh, the problem with that is that it's, you're, you're, you're always going to get, that's going to push your estimates towards zero. So this, this thing, whatever you do, this pushes your estimates towards zero, okay? Um, and... If you do the sum of squares, it's going to do it kind of continuously, okay? But if you do it like this, with sum of squares, the, the, the slope at zero is zero. Zero is going to be, a, you always be a little bit away from zero, sort of generically. Um, with this one, the slope at zero is one. So there, there's like kind of a, there's a kink at zero, right? So you, you kind of get stuck at zero, and you only leave zero if you have enough reason to, okay? So this induces some kind of sparsity in these estimates. You're going to make W... The W estimates are very sparse. Many of them are going to be zero. Some of them are going to be positive. Okay. And the idea is that if you got a, a large K, you have a huge number of regressors, you're going to get like false positives. So you want to kind of tame that a little bit. Okay. Regularization is what it's called, the regularization technique. Um, you want to tame that and so you get fewer false positives. Okay. So that's that's one method that you can do. All right. Um, there are other methods. There's a whole industry different kind of variants on lasso and stuff like that, okay, um, that we could look into, all right. Now, um, that's on, so that's one thing on the estimation side, okay, and now the, the other, uh, the other direction that we can go, that, that's, that's a whole alley you can, you know, series of, of stuff that you can look at related to, the, on the econometric side, almost purely looking at lasso, okay, but, well, I'm not an econometrician, first of all. So, so let, let's look at, let's go down more the ML path, okay? So when you go down the ML path, okay, you start, you kind of ramp up the complexity of the models arbitrarily, especially once you get started, start going towards deep learning, okay? 
Um, and then you need to introduce ways to, to, to control that, right? To, to prevent overfitting because the basic idea is you're going to get very complex models. You, you hopefully have a lot of data. Okay. You're going to get very complex models. Um, and so you're gonna have a lot of parameters. Okay. And you want to, you want to not overfit basically. Okay, because if you overfit, you're just going to get garbage out when you try and look outside of sample. Okay, so um, let's for, first let me talk about what's going on, what, how we step from logistic regression to neural network. Okay, and then we can go from from neural network to like whatever deep learning. Okay, um, all right. So so for, so basically though, uh, for the neural network, okay, we're we're using little cells, okay? Um, so, you know, you have some thing, it takes in a bunch of, uh, you know, basically the whole X vector, okay? And then it outputs something, okay? Um, and so before we saw, you know, that, you know, CI was equal to W dot XI, that's a vector product plus B, okay? So you had linear, uh, interior, okay, some sigmoid function, and then out. So, so this is. Well, actually, this was that was pi, okay. So this is uh, this is pi. You got you you have put a continuous variable between zero and one, okay. Um, okay, so so the what the what we're first going to do is generalize this notion. So you could call this a neuron if you want. It was the inspiration for it. Okay, you could call that a neuron. That's a that's that's the fundamental unit here. And then each of these is like x i one, x i two, through x i k. All right, so this is length k. Um, you can uh, you can generalize. Usually, the interior this this linear stage step is the same, and then you just change what you put in here. Okay, so you could just keep it identity. You can make have this be identity and, and make it linear. Okay, so in general, this is going to be. Um, some f, we'll call it f, okay? And this will be some yi, okay? Now, what is f? Okay, so there's a couple, there's a million different options, okay? You could do any sort of sigmoid logistic kind of thing. Um, you could do what's called a uh, rectified linear unit, okay? ReLU would be f of x is equal to the max of um, zero and x, right? So it's just, you know, for a while it's zero, and then once x it's zero, it becomes linear, okay? So you pick up a threshold, but also a measure of an intensity. So you get both an extensive and intensive information. For, um, so for that sigmoid, whatever you choose, you know, it's gonna look like that, okay? From zero to one. And this is gonna be like zero to x, basically. Okay, so that'll be the sigmoid. Okay, you can do other ones, uh, hyperbolic sine or some you know, the various things you can do. You switch up exactly what that f function is. Okay, um, but re ReLU is pretty pretty common actually because you get you get both the intensive, you get a nonlinearity, but then you get intensive information after the nonlinearity. Okay, that's the advantage. All right, so then how do we? Um, for, for, for more complex kind of things, uh, what do we do? Well, uh, we, we create a more complex neural network. Okay, so we, or we take these and then and turn them into to a neural network. So, so essentially you have um, some, some data source, okay? You have some output still, okay? So this is like input. And output, and then you got a bunch of stuff happening in between. Right, right here, I'll just draw one layer. Okay, so let's say we have four units here. Okay, that input's gonna go into all of these. Okay, and this input could be a vector. It's gonna be a vector, right? It's gonna be a vector. It's going into all of these. Okay, um, those are all gonna output something, okay? And they'll output, say, a vector, okay? And that's gonna go 
in there into the to the output neuron okay so um so now you have first of all you have the potential for nonlinearity here right so before we had the sigmoid and we were doing kind of a logistic thing and that was sort of self-contained here we have you know you have some nonlinearity okay and that'll get picked up here okay um and then you're gonna combine so so let's let's keep it simple here and say that like you know, let's say that this is some 10 dimensional input. Okay. Maybe it's a really simple kind of word vector thing. Okay. And then let's say that these each output one. Okay. And then this will, this will add them all up. Right. And it'll output one. Okay. So it adds up the, the outputs of these four neurons. Okay. So the idea would be to, to make the analog to, to the, to the visual cortex. Okay. I guess I'm out of time here, but make the analog to the visual cortex. The idea is this is like, you know, a really high dimensional information. These pick up features, you know, do you see a corner? Do you see like a top left corner, top right corner, bottom left corner, bottom right corner. And then this aggregates into, Oh, that's a square, right? As long as they're, you see all four of those things and they're in the right place, that's a square or a rectangle. Okay. So, um, so you, you kind of, you, this, your raw data, this picks up features in addition to the, the presence, also the intensity, and this aggregates them to higher and higher levels of abstraction, okay? Or in the case of words, you know, you see certain words, if you see both value and function, you know, you're talking about value function, and maybe you're talking about policy function, this will pick that up at a higher level of aggregation, and then you combine that into, oh, is this an economist talking or something, or a macroeconomist talking, okay? So, and then, the, the step after this is, well, now make, you know, 50 of these and make five different layers all going through each other, and then I'll put that. And then at that point, though, you have hundreds, if not thousands or more uh, parameters, and that, that creates issues, and that's that's where you have to get, that's where, that's where some of the more advanced um, techniques for machine learning come in and become very, use, not just useful, but very necessary to get sensible answers, okay? So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk. We're going to talk about okay, increase complexity. There's so many different ways you can increase complexity. We need to talk about the particular ways that have been used and that have been successful, and in what context they've been successful. And then we'll talk about the techniques for like what is like estimation, preventing overfitting, validation, and stuff like that. Okay, so that's for next time. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, any question? If you have questions, let me know. I'll, I'll I'll hang out here for a bit in the in the chat. Um, and if you have questions or homework also, yeah, just, just let me know and I'll be here if you want to talk, uh, later, I can do that too. Okay. And, uh, have a good weekend. Yep. Uh, what's up, Yichung? We got a question about the, the Clay Quartum model. Fire away. All right. Let me know. What's, what's the question? Heterogeneous part. Okay, so we're adding in Q heterogeneity, Q hat heterogeneity. Yep. Okay. Um, you wanna you wanna go on to Zoom? We can go on to Zoom if you want. Okay, you want you want me to explain here or go on Zoom? 
Sure. Okay. Let me, uh, I think I put the Zoom. This is a semi-public channel, so I don't want to reveal my Zoom ID. Um, but I think I put it on the Blackboard. Let me check. Um, give, me a, give me a second here to fire up Blackboard. We are in, what's our, yeah, topics and macro faculty info. So if you, oh, okay, let me create, let me put it on Blackboard, okay? Uh, what just happened? Sorry, create contact here. I'm gonna create my name, Professor. And then um, I'm gonna put my Zoom ID there. And my Zoom ID is which? Okay, so I just um, updated Blackboard with my Zoom. So if you go to Blackboard for this course, faculty information, got my Zoom ID there. I'm gonna create that now and then we can go from there, okay? So anyone, I mean, they, we can just do, if anyone wants to pop in, uh, I'll be there now. Okay. Sound good? All right, cool. So, so just go to Blackboard and uh, go to faculty info. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to shut down Twitch and transition to Zoom because I don't want my computer to blow up from doing too many things at once. Okay, so I'll see you guys on Zoom. Bye-bye.